<laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Today we're discussing the Game of Thrones series finale. This finale was rightfully named the Iron Throne. And before we get into the video, I just want to thank everybody. You know, we just hit 27,000 subscribers, and I'm truly, truly grateful for all of you for making this platform possible. If you're looking for additional content on this channel, then you're in luck. I have many more videos currently on the master list to produce, and we'll be covering Westworld, the Lord of the Rings series, and so, so much more in the upcoming months. Please be sure to click subscribe and turn notifications on to stay up to date. Without further ado, let's talk about Ghost finally getting the pats he deserves. Oh, did something else happen that you would like to discuss? Was there anything more important in this entire series than this pinnacle moment? No? Awesome. Because that's actually all I care to talk about. This idea keeps creeping into my mind that if the last 80 minutes of this show would have just been John giving Ghost head scratches that he deserves, it undoubtedly would have gotten a higher rating than 4.6. I'm not angry. I'm not upset. Nothing in the finale has me up in arms. I don't hate the final moments. I'm not distraught over plot points or loose ends. I'm just numb. I wasn't moved beyond words nor taken back by incredible moments like previous season finales delivered. I just experienced it, and the screen went black. Now, there are some issues that I do have that I'll point out when they come, but I don't know. Perhaps this feeling is just the shock of our dearly beloved finally being over. But let's get into it now and try to figure out our collective thoughts overall. The episode begins with the grim Tyrion walking through the broken city of King's Landing, followed by Jon and Davos. His eyes stayed glued to the ground, not holding his head high like the Tyrion of old, but slowly walking through the outcome of his actions. He's ashamed of what his queen has done to this place. He's ashamed of what he's done to this place. Tyrion tries to leave and Jon expresses that it's not safe, that he's worried about the unsullied and Dothraki soldiers that he witnessed on a rampage last episode. He passes a cracked bell on his way to the keep, symbolizing that Danny didn't just destroy the city, she destroyed their ability to give up. They would succumb to her merciless slaughter without quarter, and the next scene enforces that. Grey Worm executes the Lannister soldiers that had just given up, and Jon pleads to stop this insanity, but ultimately concedes. How much more defeated do you want them to be? They're on their knees. They are breathing. Look around you, friend. We won. Tyrion walks through the tattered map room, a crack cutting through the neck of Westeros showing the destruction that Danny has brought to this land, also showing a symbolic divide that now exists with the people who survived this Targaryen coming to power. Tyrion slowly consumes screen time and goes to find his brother and sister crushed under rubble, the golden lion's hand sticking out of the bricks and his brother's last moment spent with the person that he loved most. I believe that in this moment, Tyrion realizes that his attempt to save his brother ultimately led to this scene. Torn between the solace of them being together in the end, and the anguish that his actions caused him to be the last remaining Lannister, Cersei and Jaime leave this world just as they entered it, together. Arya and Jon walk to the newly affirmed queen, Dothraki somehow regenerating their numbers through photosynthesis or Westworld host printing, and the picture here is one of tyranny, one of delusional victory. Starting with Jon's approach of this massive building draped in a Targaryen flag, we're reminded of why this building was red in the first place. Aegon built his castle of Red Rock to remind the people of the fire that he roasted his enemies in, so whenever King's Landing looked up, they would see the price of defiance. Joffrey Baratheon. I don't think any quote better fits why we see this shot as Jon looks on, about to climb the stairs that he helped conquer. We get this wicked shot showing Danny, and imagery-wise it's stunning, but it's also cool for another reason. The last time we saw her was the mental break she had as the bell sounded. The entire time she burned the city, we never got a shot of her riding anymore. Now that she emerges from the dragon with dragon wings flying toward the heavens, it's almost like she was the dragon in those scenes, like we were supposed to divest from her as a person and just witness her as the destructive force that dragons present, which ultimately is what's happening, and another push to her as the villain in this series. She stands over the remnants of her city, delivering an impressive speech that can be best summarized in one simple word. Insanity. People to this day tell me that she isn't the Mad Queen, yet she just delivered a speech that compared what she did to a successful liberation of the oppressed. She stands on countless dead innocents, and proudly swears that she would bring this liberation to the rest of the world. The shots of John and Tyrion are important here. It shows that they are contemplating her words carefully. Tyrion may be more than John in this case because she's speaking a foreign language to him, but look at his ears perk up as soon as she says Winterfell. 
Winter Velva Dornot. Tyrion comes forward and admits to setting his brother free. It's the honorable thing to do here because he publicly denounces his position as Hand of the Queen. He throws the golden pin, symbolizing the position of power, down from the high stairs that they stand on to the feet of the soldiers below. It means nothing anymore if a queen won't listen to her advisors, so he discards it. Arya gives additional insight to Jon that her sisters may not be safe with this new ruler, but the real persuasion comes next, when Tyrion and Jon talk with each other. We know the outcome, and other than a few sharp lines, nothing really needs to be dissected. John was convinced to kill Danny here. Something that I do want to note is that John states, love is the death of duty, and Tyrion replies that sometimes duty is the death of love. What John is really saying here is that love blinds him, and it makes knowing what his duty is difficult. Tyrion states that perhaps it is your duty just to kill Danny, to kill your love for the greater good. This line was first delivered by Maester Aemon at Castle Black, of which I think this clip here perfectly sums up why we get the scene that we did. Love is the death of duty. If the day should ever come when your Lord Father was forced to choose between honor on the one hand and those he loves on the other, what would he do? He would do whatever was right, no matter what. John has to choose duty or love. Also noting in this interaction that otherwise, John would someday be on the same chopping block as Tyrion and his sisters would likely be at risk as well. I was a little thrown off while watching that these two were able to have such a long conversation together that this revelation was able to take place, but I don't know. Next we come to Jon approaching Danny. Drogon is resting under a mountain of snow as he approaches the throne room, and I loved this scene. Seeing him come out from underneath of that snow put the biggest smile on my face. I'm not even sure why, honestly. Perhaps this is just giving the Mighty Beast other real-world traits that we can relate to. Not just a mythical creature, but more of a silly dog sleeping in silly places. It even sniffs Jon to make sure that he was okay, and Drogon ultimately allows him to enter. We next see Danny entering what is left of the Great Hall. Her visions in the House of the Undying come true, but this time she touches the thing that she has so longed to acquire. A nice place to sit with lower lumbar support. Danny talks about how the throne was much smaller than she imagined, a subtle push that this victory isn't exactly how she saw things going. Also that perhaps now that she has the throne, it's still not enough. Seeing it manifested before her makes her realize that it is just a chair, and the rest of the world still calls out for liberation. In the books, however, the throne is this massive structure, and looks more like this. John begs Danny to forgive Tyrion to forgive the oath the Lannister soldiers made to Cersei, and she refuses to spare any of them. Mercy isn't a thing to her anymore, and honestly, this prediction made me happiest of all. She has constantly needed to be reminded to be merciful. Constantly, her advisors did this, and now that she stands before her prize alone, she has no one to tell her to be merciful. No one except for John. and sadly in these final moments, she doesn't listen. John shoves his dagger into the chest of fire, just as Arya shoved her dagger into the chest of ice. It would appear that this story was about the Starks being the protectors of the realm. Through countless trials and tribulations, they did the honorable things that they needed to do. Ned Stark's children through and through. It's a beautiful story in that way. Seeing Drogon push his nose against his dead mother had me feeling some kind of way. Just like the scene before, they are showing Drogon with a real understanding of what's happening around him. As Tyrion described before, dragons are much smarter than we give them credit for. Dragons are intelligent. More intelligent than men, according to some maesters. They have affection for their friends, and fury for their enemies. So when Drogon melts the Iron Throne, one of two things are happening here. Either Drogon sees the pointy sword sticking out of Danny's chest and burns the Iron Throne, thinking that it was it that killed his mother, or Drogon realizes that all the bloodshed was just for this stupid chair, and rids the world of it. I guess I'll propose a third option as well, that Drogon had the foresight into the future to destroy this chair because, well, it needed to be wheelchair accessible. Eh, I guess my money's on number two. I really like this idea that dragons in this universe are just that intelligent, that they could comprehend the carnage in pursuit of power, and ultimately he destroyed it to get rid of the world of any other ruler feeling the need to bring bloodshed for that chair. Like I proposed in my previous video, the purpose of this chair burning was to symbolize the change in government that we see later on. Something noteworthy about this as well is Danny won. 
She did all of this, lost everything for that stupid little chair, and she never sat on it once. Heartbreaking. Drogon takes Danny and probably flees to Valeria in mourning. Maybe he's going back to Essos to find red priestesses that can revive the dead, but I suppose that we'll never know. I suppose that it doesn't matter. Perhaps the story of fire and ice lives on, though. We saw the Night King destroyed, which was the symbolic link the dangers of ice present, and we know a dragon still lives, the token dangers of fire still roaming the world. I think that this could be foreshadowing the idea that the dangers of ice are still very present, just as the dangers of fire are, meaning that the Night King and the Long Night coming back by whatever means is still very much on the table but that's the double-edged sword with magic elements. The next part of this episode is several weeks later, as the remaining lords of Westeros figure out what comes next. Tyrion and Jon remain as prisoners, meaning that Jon for some reason told Grey Worm that it was he who killed Danny. Since her death, the Unsullied have declared a kind of martial law, but I really struggle to imagine how many people exist in the ruins of this place that aren't unsullied in Dothraki. Yara shows us that the actions of Danny, to some, are defensible, that she was right in doing what she did, and they remain loyal to her. Arya kindly reminds Yara that Jon is family, and I think Yara gets the message. Davos acts as mediator and ultimately fails. As Grey Worm states, they want justice, not a prize for doing what they did, and then demands Tyrion's silence. Naturally, Tyrion goes on to talk freely for many, many more minutes. Edmure Tully stands up, and I actually started laughing, only to start laughing louder when Sansa tells him to sit down. He is quite literally a joke manifested, and I love it so much. <laughs> Sam goes next and recommends democracy to the cackles of everyone looking on. They instead settle on something similar to the Electoral College that will vote to replace the current ruler after each one dies. They vote that Bran is suited for this position by whatever means, which, okay, decent Decent concept, sound logic, I guess, but we're kind of all overlooking the fact that he knowingly allowed millions to die so that he could sit on this throne. He could have walked any tyrant off of any cliff in the world, but okay. Regardless of how insane it is that they believe that he is best to rule, I propose that they're all unaware of one critical error in this plan. The last three-eyed raven sat in that tree for a thousand years. Do you think I wanted to sit here for a thousand years watching the world from a distance as the roots grew through me? We don't know if Bran explicitly has the same ability, but he is the three-eyed raven and the show has done nothing to state that he doesn't. All I'm saying is that it may be a long time before we need someone else to rule. When they all went around voting for Bran to be ruler, I thought Sansa was going to stand up and say, like, am I a joke to you all? <laughs> Have you not realized that I was created for this role? Now you give it to my brother who has done nothing to help at all? Literally nothing? Give me one shred of evidence that he has helped us and I will concede the entire kingdom to him? We didn't get this, of course, and she didn't get to be ruler. Instead, she got the North, and Bran is the ruler of Six Flags. Which, okay, now I'm having some kind of cognitive dissonance. It's great that she got the North. Fantastic. She wins something. But why? Why are we seeing the nations divided at all if this single ruler is going to be the best ruler in the world? Does Sansa believe her brother could become corrupted? She is segregating from the winning side just to be isolated. Queen of the North all day long, yes, I'm happy for that, but why does this matter? Why not just split all the kingdoms if this wasn't an issue at all? I just, I don't understand here. It feels like a consolation prize just so Sansa could be doing something in the last shots of this series. Moving on, and nope, not moving on. Never mind. I'm sorry. Bran? Bran won the Game of Thrones? Jon Snow did everything that he needed to do in order to save his people dozens of times. He is a hero who would not have sat by while evil controlled the world. You know who did just do that exact thing? Bran. Tell me this guy isn't evil. Go ahead, please, change my mind. John never would have sat by, just as John never would have burned King's Landing to the ground. If we would have gotten a final scene where Bran sat in the Great Hall contemplating and the camera zoomed in onto his eyes and they slowly turned blue, I would have understood. I would have, that would have made sense. Bran being king does not. I'm telling you, it's so silly. His magic journey through the north all so that he could be the best king ever. It's like they created this overpowered character and did not know what to do with him. So they just put him aside and ignored him as much as they could until boom, that's the twist. He was always meant to be king after everyone killed everyone else. 
Everyone had a role to play, and if it didn't happen exactly like this, the Starks wouldn't have won. It's something, I mean, I don't know if I'll ever understand how Bran is the most deserving of this crown. John, the natural leader that was such a natural leader, people couldn't help but flock to him. Is that all bullshit too? He's able to say no now and it just sticks. Game of Thrones was basically musical chairs and the guy that couldn't leave his seat won. I mean, Hodor died so that Bran could survive and go on to watch Countless die so that he could be king. Tell me exactly what is kingly about Bran sitting by, sitting idle, allowing people to die, good and bad, just so he could end up on the throne. And he knew everything that was going to happen the entire time, and it's sealed when he says, why do you think I'm here in the first place? Okay, moving on. So John's fate is being sent back to Castle Black, which still exists. He did all of this just to be sent back to the wall, and I am so confused. Why? I guess Tyrion makes a point, we'll always need a prison for people, but why on earth was Jon Snow a part of this story? He's just going back to prison again. Part of me sees this as a happy ending. After all, his entire story unfolded after he was sent to the Wall. They made such a big deal about his parentage, dying and coming back, all just to end up back at the Wall, or back in the True North with Tormund, as it's implied later on. I mean, how did he not walk away with anything? He is the most deserving in this entire land. It is a laughable offense that we're just going to forget about his ability to lead people because he killed the evil queen. Why send him north? The Unsullied leave 30 seconds later. Just let him go home to Winterfell. Unless they're trying to tell me that the true north was always where he was supposed to be, in which case they did a terrible job of setting that up, because the only line that comes to mind is the single one from Tormund about the true north running through his veins. Okay, moving on. I'm triggered. The line about ask me in 10 years makes me think it's entirely possible that we see something in 10 years, continuing this same storyline. Maybe with Evil Bran, maybe not. Perhaps I'm asking too much. Sansa becomes Queen of the North, and Arya sets sail for whatever is west of Westeros. She suddenly has an urge to explore the world, I guess? Which, you'd think she would just turn to her left and go, hey Bran, what's over there? And But never mind, I guess not. Duh, why would they do that? Finally, Bran, the King of Six Flags. Brienne writes Jaime's good deeds in the Book of Brothers, and Tyrion hosts the first ever small council meeting. They talk about the future of the realm and how to rule it, showing us the good guys that from here on out will be taking care of everybody. Sam gives Tyrion a song of ice and fire, which is a cool concept, until they make the comment about Tyrion not being in it. It's a funny callback to Varys telling him history would not remember him, but it does not excuse the fact that Tyrion was a major player for, like, this entire thing. He has done a plethora of noteworthy things, and 100% would be mentioned in the story at some point. I know this is a minor thing, but it just doesn't make sense that he's not in the book. A couple other things to note about the scene. Bran wouldn't need a Master of Whispers, because, duh. And Brienne must have already knighted Podrick because she calls him Sir, so that's nice. Also, Davos getting a happy ending is pretty awesome to me. John gets to the wall and pats Ghost. Literally, the best part of this episode. I was never more happy watching this season than when I was watching Ghost get the head pats that he deserved. In the end, the Starks win, and they all go their separate ways and carry with them stories of heroism and honor, spreading it across the world. I may be disappointed with the rush season, or how some things just fundamentally don't make sense to me, but I'll never be upset that the Starks came out of this the victors. The Game of Thrones series ends as the series started, beyond the wall. Some fresh green sprouting up to show us that life returns to this area, and with it, prosperity for Jon in his new life. I fully believe that he won't return to Castle Black. I mean, why would he? But I suppose that's for everyone to decide for themselves now. Thank you so much for watching this video and supporting this channel. If you like this video, please be sure to subscribe for more just like it, and consider joining Patreon if you feel so inclined to. Big shout out to Chris Cole, Michael Link, and Robert Holtz. Also, remember guys, we have many more videos planned out. I also have a book coming out very soon. Much love everybody, and I can't wait to talk to you all again soon.